There is a hyacinth bloom in a vase on my kitchen table. My amazing partner bought it for me a few days ago. We were spending a luxuriously lazy day home together, and she said she was going out for a walk. When she got back, she was holding the packaging I recognized from the florist next door. I tore through the wrapping to find a gorgeous deep fuchsia blossom. Oh, sweetie, I exclaimed, it's beautiful. So are you, she responded, and pulled me in for a kiss. We gazed into each other's eyes, lingering in a moment of pure loving connection. It's hard to imagine that this incredible love that I am so blessed to have in my life wouldn't have existed if I had listened to my mother. Like so many people before me, I've made the choice to listen to myself and to live a happy, authentic life. And it's taken me a long time to understand that if I had not been my mother's daughter, I wouldn't be the strong, courageous, determined person that I am today. In fact, it's my struggle for authenticity that's what I'm most proud of. My mother has been like the sand in the oyster, without which there would be no pearl. As Nancy Friday put it, when I stopped seeing my mother through the eyes of a child, I saw the woman who helped me give birth to myself. The woman who helped me give birth to myself was born in 1951 in the newly founded state of Israel, the child of Polish and Russian immigrants who left their homes to settle in their biblical homeland. What guts, solidarity, belonging, acceptance, these were the keys to survival in what was the fledgling Jewish communities in what was then Palestine. My grandparents kept a traditional Orthodox Jewish household, although not a perfectly strict one. I remember my mother recounting how appearance was everything. It mattered that people thought you were observing the commandments more than what you actually did in your home. <laughs> when my mother was 23, she met my father, a secular New York Jew who was visiting as a tourist. At first, she wouldn't date him because he wasn't religious, but when he said he'd stay in Israel and study with a rabbi, my mother relented. Within a year, they were married, then pregnant, and then just five weeks after giving birth to me, they moved across the world to the desert of Fresno, California, where my father had found a college teaching job. My mother must have felt so small and alone in this foreign little town. But being a tough Israeli woman, she never let a challenge stop her, and she miraculously made a traditional Jewish household right in the middle of Raisin country. And so my mother mothered me according to her life's trajectory and groomed me to be a dutiful Jewish wife and mother, an Eshet Chayel, a woman of valor, who would tirelessly care for her husband and household. Like the song lyrics say, she anticipates the needs of her household and the bread of idleness she does not eat. I wanted to make my mother proud, so I was her perfect child, good in school, good at home, and it was inconceivable that I would bring anything but naches, pride, and blessings to her life. And I bought into her vision of my future and looked forward to the day when I would marry a nice Jewish man under the chuppah at my big Jewish wedding, surrounded by family and community. But it was not to be. It wasn't until I was a teenager that my perfect child persona began to unravel and my relationship with my mom became more and more strained. When I was 16, I told her I was dating someone who wasn't Jewish. She said marrying someone who isn't Jewish is worse than the Holocaust. The only thing worse than the physical killing of the Jewish people is the spiritual killing of the Jewish people. It wasn't until a few years ago I realized how much pain this statement had caused me. She's comparing me to Hitler? But I pushed it aside. I told myself I didn't need my mother or her religion or anything for that matter. I moved away to college and afterwards moved across the country and settled down with my, again, non-Jewish boyfriend. When I was 24, I told my mother I was engaged. She tried to convince me to call it off, but when that didn't work, said she wouldn't be at the wedding. One of my most painful memories is during a trip to Israel with my family that year, feeling utterly invisible as we visited with my mother's relatives and friends, yet my engagement was never mentioned. After 12 years of marriage, I told my mom I was separating from my husband and that I was gay. Just like that, way to break it to her gently. <laughs> she said that gay relationships are destroying the fabric of society that there is a right and a wrong way to live? And have I thought about what message it's sending to children to live any way you choose? 
And then she said that if I'm ever in a relationship with a woman, we would not be welcome in her home. That night I sobbed and sobbed, not just for this rejection, but for all of it. I let the grief flow until there were no more tears. Instead, there was a sense of strength I didn't know I had that's been growing in me ever since. My relationship with my mother ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's peaceful. Sometimes I get angry. Sometimes the old grief rises up and we have to take a break from each other. But for the most part, we've stayed in contact and we're honest with each other. And I've come to see that as different as we are, my mother and I are keenly alike. We're both tough, we're intensely spiritual, and we're very clear about who we are. My mother modeled that for me. And I know that no matter where I go in life, she's a part of me. Whether I'm lighting Shabbat candles with my son or solstice candles with my partner, whether I'm chanting a Torah portion or a Buddhist mantra, whether I'm reading The Chosen or Stone Butch Blues, I'll always be my mother's daughter. <laughs>